Seattle. Welcome, everybody. Um, I will uh, speak about uh, I'm feeling and empathy in the first place, uh, like a uh, uh, philosophical approach. And in the second part, I will uh, speak about the particular cases of, of art of, uh, where these kind of concepts have a relationship in a good way or in a bad way, okay, in Portugal and uh, outside. I will speak in, in Portuguese, but also in English. I will do some kind of mix. So this this the, this first uh, image is about uh, some kind of uh, um, question about the importance of the aesthetic experience. Uh, as we can say, uh, o estético representa uma forma especial da experiência humana. Uma arte sem experiência existencial própria fica vazia. Essa experiência não pode substituir-se pelo conhecimento, uh, por ouvir, nem pelo estudo. Não se pode procurar, nem mesmo construir a experiência. Ela é que nos procura. Uh, which means that uh, the, the, in art uh, it's important to have the experience at the first place and to, to start to listen, to see, and if possible, also to touch what is going on. O objetivo da arte é revelar a arte e ocultar o artista. Toda a arte é ao mesmo tempo superfície e símbolo. Uh, the main uh, objective of art is to reveal art itself and not to show the artist. And uh, to, uh, every art, uh, uh, always art is at the same time um, sur surface and symbol. A filosofia tem desde logo como missão relativamente à arte, como a todo o processo de verdade, mostrá-la como tal. A filosofia é com efeito a intermediária dos encontros com as verdades, ela é a alcoviteira do verdadeiro. I don't know how to, to translate this, but yes. But uh, philosophy has the, the, the main uh, mission to uh, show the process of truth in art and show what is art. So, at the first place, what means I'm feeling and empathy and uh, sympathy, no? uh, the meaning of the word. O conceito I'm feeling foi introduzido uh, pelo pensador alemão Robert Bischoff, filósofo, em 1873, uh, no contexto no vocabulário filosófico, indo buscá-lo aos românticos alemães. The, 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 it's very important, the origin is, of course, the romanticism in, in German. We can um, we can speak uh, and uh, in, in two ways. Okay. Uh, podemos tomar esta ideia de duas maneiras diferentes, uh, no sentido psicológico, não é? Designa uma carga, uma projeção do eu nos seres, nas coisas e na natureza. No fundo. É uma objetivação da nossa vida afetiva, uma identificação entre o sujeito e o objeto, entre o eu e o outro, através de sentimentos. Esta identificação, para vários autores, constitui-se como a essência, a característica determinante do sentimento estético. So, in the psychological meaning, it means a, a kind of a charge, a projection of, uh, of me in, in, the other, in the other, in the other, in the nature, the things, the beings. And this means the truth of the uh, aesthetic experience. Muitas das vezes aparece traduzida I'm feeling por empatia. E nós em português dizemos muito empatia. Vem da palavra empatia do grego. E simpatia, significando uma comunhão, uma partilha entre o ser e o sentimento. Uh, sometimes it also is translated by empathy from the Greek empatia and sympathy, meaning a kind of um, a, a a uh, kind of uh, uh, a, part, uh, a communion between the, the being and the, and the feeling. Uh, contudo, simpatia não traduz uma atração psicológica por coisas, ser a natureza, mas é mais inclusivo, pois significa, de outro modo, a integração de experiências de repulsa ou desagrada em face de tal pessoa, atos que consideramos horríveis, feias. Uh, but sympathy means also not only attraction, but also the, op the, the opposite. Uh, 
so the kind of experiences of evil or um, of uh, or orphal, uh, etc., etc. Sua vez, empatia uh, digna ainda na área da psicologia social, a compreensão do outro através de um esforço intelectual, uh, através até, digamos, de outro tipo de situações uh, que implicam uh, uma não comunhão exatamente com o outro, mas a tentativa intelectual de entender o outro. So, empathy means also that this kind of, uh, uh, of motivation to understand the other in an intellectual way, not by feeling, but understanding what, what he's doing, even we don't like what he's doing. We have also Vichy, uh, que entende ainda o sensível como símbolo de um conteúdo espiritual, na medida em que a condição do estético só se realiza quando o objeto é, uh, portanto, apreendido, espiritualizado, por assim dizer. E para Lips, as linhas de um desenho só são belas se as podemos interpretar como o trajeto de um movimento, de uma força. Aliás, uh, o Theodor Lips desenvolveu uma série de uma tipologia uh, relativamente ao traço uh, do desenho uh, e concentrou-se em questões elementares uh, que têm a ver com a estética e com as artes plásticas. E escreveu um livro muito importante exatamente sobre esta matéria. So, uh, also Vichy, which is an important German philosopher, uh, talk about the sensible and the symbol of uh, a kind of material and spiritual uh, Uh, content um, in the way that uh, the static realizes um, does uh, anything when uh, an object has to do with a kind of a, 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 a spiritualization. So, and also he tried to understand the lines of a drawing uh, in a way that, that has to do with movement and force. So, with energy, we can understand art. We can understand a drawing. This is a beautiful drawing for Rubens. It's a, a work uh, he was doing to make a great picture. Uh, and uh, he was studying the figure of Hercules. And so we can see in this drawing, uh, in fact, the lines, uh, the strength of the lines, the energy, and also all the, the, the force, all the energy Hercules has to, 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 do, to, to move. Uh, to, to, to win the, the, the lion, to win the, the fight. And the uh, lips work very hard about this. It's a kind of formalism, but anywhere. Uh, so there is also another uh, important uh, concept or notion, which is called symbolic sympathy, sympathy symbolica. Uh, do pensador francês Bach, que nos conduz à questão do símbolo como fundamento da contemplação estética, que reúne um conteúdo e a expressão disto através da imagem, por exemplo. If I, uh, so, we can also speak about symbolic sympathy uh, from uh, Bach, uh, which means that the symbol has a, um, has a, has a base, has basis, has a con uh, aesthetic contemplation and also a content And the expression is the way we can access to the to the to the to the symbol. Um, Bach também aprofunda as questões do papel do artista, que é um tema que normalmente não é tratado nesta estética, que anda também um bocadinho próxima do idealismo alemão, uh, mas aprofunda este conceito do Einfühling no artista e não somente do contemplador. Portanto, uh, he established a, a, a point, a liaison, between the artist and the public. And he tries to understand what is sympathy and what is unfeeling from the artist. Uh, uh, através da simpatia e um mídia de emoções e da imaginação, o artista pode criar inúmeros símbolos que espoletam a contemplação estética. And he has a conclusion Uh, uh, through sympathy with many emotions work and from imagination is possible the artist to create many symbols that uh, are a kind of trigger to aesthetic contemplation.
So we can um, say two things uh, in a way uh, the empathy static, uh, uma oposição entre o idealismo alemão, a chamada estética do conteúdo e a estética psicológica da segunda metade do século XIX. So the, the empathy static has a position very important between uh, German idealism and, and romanticism also and uh, the psychological aesthetic that you developed in the second uh, moitié, uh, second part of the 19th century. But in other way, these ideas lost uh, fundaments, lost basis, and uh, they lost basis in front of the experimentalism, the scientific psychology, the behavioral psychology, the art psychology, and in the other art, in the other side also, because the aesthetic, of course, is based in a, in a kind of spiritualism, of pantheism, uh, of anthropomorphism that is also uh, very criticized for other, uh, other authors. Charles Lalo uh, salientou que a comunicação intuitiva entre sujeito e objeto é uma condição base de toda a percepção e não da experiência estética, a que a teoria da empatia assenta, portanto, numa estética puramente subjetivista. Uh, Charles Lalo uh, say that uh, the, the communication uh, between uh, 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 me and the object is uh, a, a condition that is a basis for perception, all kind of perception. So this static is very uh, subjectivist and uh, cannot go on. Okay. Uh, another person that has uh, importance about the, the, the Criticizing is Mark Scheller, that also say that the, 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 the side of, uh, of game, of, uh, um, of pleasure and fiction uh, that is important in art are not in the mind of the, 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 the philosophers of Einstein. So it's outside their discourse, the importance of game, the importance of fiction also. And Etienne Souriau uh, avança que estes filósofos defensores da empatia não conseguem explicar a especificidade do juízo estético, assim como a obra criada pelos artistas não se reduz à emotividade de projeção do eu. Tal seria uma desconsideração da atividade artística e do trabalho que ela envolve. So, Etienne Souriau uh, says that uh, the philosophers that are, that are uh, the authors of the empathy do not are not able to explain the specificity, specificity of the static judgment and that uh, the, 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 the object, artist objects created by the artist are not only a response to emotivity, to emotion, but, and projection of me, but uh, they, they involve lots of other things and many works. So this is not considered by these authors. At the same time, I, 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 I make a, a small question. Uh, is, 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 may, may we consider even today uh, the empathy as a factor of uh, understanding art, of uh, uh, making a liaison between the people and art? May we also uh, integrate empathy as a factor, as an item, not as a only uh, global theory? And I would like to do this not with words, of course with words, but with images of several cases that, uh, that show that there is also uh, this relationship, this communication between art and, 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 uh, and, and uh, the human beings. So the first, the first uh, artist I, I brought, it was impossible not to speak about him, is Marcel Duchamp. Eu não posso subir esta coisa. Porque as pessoas não vejam as legendas. Ao tirar ou pôr para cima? Eu também não sei. Põe para cima, então. Ok, pronto, obrigada. E eu também não vejo. Ok, thank you. Uh, and so, uh, I, I talk about Marcel Duchamp because uh, he began to do what we say ready-made and also what we say uh, objet trouvé. So, uh, so there, there are two things uh, different. Uh, the ready-made um, uh, have sometimes 
uh, an activity of the artist, some mark he puts on the object, but the les objets trouvés uh, non pas uh, <laughs> les objets trouvés uh, don't have this this mark. Uh, and the, and Marcel Duchamp does uh, did this, the, the, the both things, and this was a a problem that George Dickey, which is also a statistician, uh, discussed very much uh, because of the relationship between contemporary art and the reaction of the people. So, uh, but we have here two, two, two works of art. One is the Pescador de Garrafas. It's a piece when we put bottles to, to dry. No, it's, a, it's an object that uh, we, we found in Lisbon in the... Um, 40 years ago, I remember to see this in some uh, shops. And the other is uh, an object made with two, uh, with two pieces uh, uh, from a bike and um banco, como é que se diz banco? In English, uh, a stool, yes. And um, Marcel Duchamp make what he said to be an art not routinean, an art that has nothing to do with the pleasure, an art that is not too to have uh, to to feel okay, to feel good, to feel beauty. This was something completely um, aside of his of his way of thinking. And uh, even he has been a painter and a cubist painter before this kind of experiences. Uh, he after this. He made this picture um, in 1918 that he, uh, he called Tu Me, because uh, um, in, English, in French it's Tu Me Merde. Tu, uh, tu, it's, uh, and with this picture he made, with objects also that are uh, in, the, in the, as a, uh, a scova, no sei como é que se diz, não sei se inglês, scova. Scova. With a brush, with a brush that can. Uh, uh, harm an eye if you are you don't see with uh, you are not uh, with attention you, you you go with your eye on the on the brush it was on purpose and he says that he is a, is in a in a in a point to um, to never paint again so this picture demonstrates the will of Marcel Duchamp de, 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 to not be a painter anymore it will be only uh, a, a, a maker of objects of ready-made and installations as he does in 63 after his death in Philadelphia. So, um, I have to move, okay. So, this artist did not want empathy. This artist did want, not want I'm feeling. I'm thinking from the artist itself. The other story that is also very important was the work of Richard Serda called Cecil's Ark in New York, in a federal um, place, where he put this gigantic, gigantic uh, sculpture in a quartet, I don't know how to say in English, uh, that the people that work, uh, the agent, uh, official, uh, that work in this uh, place, um, contest and deny the existence and the, the, the well-being, the welfare, the, the harmony that they feel before. So during eight years, there was many uh, sessions in, in court, in judicial court. And after that, the, um, the sculpture was uh, destroyed and uh, slashed into pieces. And we can see on, the, on the, the right, the place where the sculpture stays, the, the, the trace on the floor. And this happens lots of times with, we say, uh, uh, site-specific um, uh, works of art. This was on site-specific. And he made, uh, um, and he was, uh, this was a very important because uh, in a certain way, uh, Donna, uh, Richard Serra wants to create something that people should notice because public culture in a, in a generally uh, became unknown from the people. They became, it, it's so daily, it's in the daily day, we don't know, we don't uh, take care of it. We don't notice. The other um, thing I want to, to, to show for you, it was this beautiful painting of Ahmad and Greif, 
an important Portuguese painter that made this picture for a gar, for a place where the boat stopped, uh, Rocha do Condovic. This is very difficult to be seen, only with the, like, with the permission of the, the, the Capitania do Porto Lisboa, it's possible to see. And this beautiful painting that was a comment from the, the, the Portuguese state uh, in 46, uh, during the end of the war, exactly at the end of the war, uh, was supposed to be uh, destroyed and painted with, with uh, white clay, white clay. And why this thing happened? Uh, Almada didn't thought uh, about this possibility. He was making uh, uh, an event very important in Portugal in 46, 48. It was the emigration to, um, to South America, to Brazil, Argentina. Uh, and the, uh, um, uh, Almada revealed, showed that the country was in a, in a difficult position. Portugal was living a very um, difficult situation. People uh, were, were suffering very much. It was not a neutral, it was a neutral country, but the war has affected us very much because Salazar was, of course, uh, a dictator. And so she saw, uh, he showed in this picture uh, to uh, th this problem of Portugal and showed people going away, people arriving. So at the same time, Almada uses a Cubist language, which was very different from the things he has made on the, on the other. Uh, uh, and so this didn't happen, but Almada um, thought this had some kind of empathy, but it, it didn't happen. And I will show only the, the, the last thing because it's also um, an important thing. I show you a, a beautiful sculpture in Lagos, Algarve, perhaps many of you know. And this sculpture was made by a um, a uh, sculpture very, very revolutionary. Uh, it was a, a, a kind of a revolution in the um, official um, sculpture in Portugal. Uh, and he made the portrait of Don Sebastião, Rei Don Sebastião, that was lost in a battle be, uh, against the Moros in Alcácer Quivir in Africa. And he was a young, he had 14 years, something like this. And uh, what uh, Coutilev show was a kind of a puppet, was a kind of uh, an infant, uh, some, someone very young that don't want to fight, has the uh, elmo on the floor, and has the arm down. He's not going to fight. He's, he's not a fighter. He's um, a, young, uh, a young boy. And this was also a criticism uh, against the colonial war. So Coutileiro do, do two things at the same time. He criticized the, the Portuguese state, and he, he criticized the kind of official and historical sculpture of the hero of the great empire that also in 72, 72 73, uh, was uh, like this in Portugal. And there was a person that came to defend Coutilheiro, was Zé Augusto França, who wrote a, a big article in Culotto Work. And so uh, the, the Câmara Municipal, the mayor, the mayor says, no, we don't want this sculpture. You have to go back with, with the sculpture. And then came the 25th of April in 74, and Coutilheiro offered this sculpture to the people of Lagos. So this culture was a, an office of, of, uh, of Coutilé. Coutilé never thought that this had no empathy, that the mayor will not uh, like this, 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 because he did not think, uh, thought about the political problem and ideological problem of this culture. So the, this shows on the other side, the side of the artist and the side also of the public, how empathy and sympathy are mixed and uh, what can happen with a work of art. It was, was my, my, I mean, okay. Thank you. For sticking around for, for the extra time, I really appreciate it. 
I'm always excited to speak about um, my research, which is something I'm very passionate about. So I'm researching uh, dance, but within the context of um, psychology and neuroscience and trying to understand how the power of interpersonal coordination or interpersonal synchrony, how this can lead us to become more empathetic um, and caring of people that are not necessarily in our in-group. So I'll be drawing on some of the, the previous uh, work of other researchers that were pre was presented today, especially Diana Prata, because as you can see, Diana is my supervisor, along with Rita Geronimo. Um, and my, uh, as Vanessa said, I'm part of two research groups, um, Psychology of Social Change, Behavior, Emotion, and Cognition. So I want to give a, a small, uh, maybe that's not work. Uh, I need to touch first. Okay, so um, a small background as to why I'm researching uh, this area. I'm uh, actually not from psychology originally. I did a, I did a, my master's in dance anthropology, um, and I was drawn to that because I grew up loving dance myself. Um, are any, is anybody here a dancer or has danced at a wedding or has danced at a concert and knows the feeling of being in a group of people moving together um, okay, wait, we have a, a number of uh, examples. So um, this led me to be particularly interested in participatory and social dances, which uh, I define here with the help of Andrei Nachuski, who's an ethnomusicologist, as dance forms that are about the process of feelings uh, and feelings of the dancers, rather than the product um, or the display of dance per se. So I focus on dances like uh, Lindy Hop, Boho, um, you can name any folk dance that involves in, uh, participation of, of people, right? Something that allows you to dance with others and connect with others through movement and through your body. So my research uh, in my master's uh, was ethno ethnographic research, and it focused on a dance community in Brussels, their international group, uh, who danced Fogo, and Fogo is a, a dance from the northeast of Brazil. Um, and what I what I was most interested in is how is it possible that in this dance form, people from a range of backgrounds, a range of different sociocultural uh, groups come together and in a really close embrace, um, dance with each other? How does this work? We all have different touch norms. We all have different proximic norms from different cultural backgrounds that we have. So how is it that people come together and almost uh, obsessively come into this community and dance with one another? So this was kind of my main research question for this ethnography. Um, and my findings were that this, this close contact, the touch in the dance, was a really important element um, for people because a lot of them were coming from different, uh, different countries. They were not living in the same place as their families or as their communities. And this dance provided them with the space to be in caring touch with one another, to relate to one another through touch. Um, also, my findings showed that um, it gave them a community to belong to, right? So when, when they danced, when they came to this group every week, uh, to the festivals, uh, to the classes, they, they created a sense of belonging to that environment, to that group. Also, the experience of connection to that community was both emotional and physical. So it involved this kind of emotional empathic connection to the group, but it was also very physical in, uh, in how that connection was created. So drawing from the theory of McNeil, who's an American historian and studied drill in the army, of how marching together with people creates a, a sense of unity and synchrony, uh, unity and solidarity. Um, I, I found that this, this second sense of connection was it's emotional, but also physical. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I need to tell you about my master's research. Oh, uh, yes, we have one more. All right. So, um, moreover, this, this form of connection that people talked about during that ethnographic research in my interviews and in my participant observation, the buzzword was connection. I, I like Foho because it makes me feel connected, because I feel the connection. And I want to know what, what does this connection mean? And it was this four interrelated experiences. Um, when I broke down and I coded my, my data, I found that connection meant the connection to oneself, uh, which comes about through the sense of kinesthetic awareness within the dance and the experience of presence in one's own body, right? So when you're dancing, you feel your body in movement and it creates an awareness of one's own self uh, and existing in a body. The second uh, form of connection was the connection to the music and its capacity to provide structure for synchrony. So it gave a pulse, it gave a rhythm for people to connect with each other in, uh, but it also gave a wide palette of emotional stimuli for the dancers. So if the song was really happy, it, they danced it in a happy way with each other. If it was really heavy, 
or slow or sad, they danced it more slowly. So this was informed by the music. And then there was the empathic connection between the two partners. And this was largely, um, this largely came out of this haptic communication, this haptic dialogue, because people were dancing in touch with each other. They held each other in a close embrace and they had to read each other's movements. It's a conversation. Um, and this creates a very, uh, very corporal kind of connection to somebody in that they had to really read and be able to, uh, as Diana was mentioning, kind of read the mind of the person they were dancing with to some extent, right? This, it involved this kind of deep level empathy of knowing what the other person was experiencing because they were experiencing together in movement, in touch. And lastly, uh, this connection was also connection to the wider folk community. So these people in Brussels, they also danced in Switzerland. Switzerland, they danced in Portugal because they went to communities and festivals outside of their local community and danced there with people and made, made connections with people that they wouldn't have normally come across. So also people with different backgrounds from their own, not just from the Brussels community, but from the Portuguese community, from the community in Germany. So um, of course, when I finished my master's work, as many of you probably also experienced in research, I had more questions than I had when I started it. So I had to pursue a PhD um, and I found, uh, I found a way to do this in that I, I wanted to look at the underlying mechanisms. So as I was saying before, there's this idea of muscular bonding or muscular sort of solidarity that comes about through synchrony. When we march together, when we move together through in synchrony or in coordination, there's a sense of uh, unity and there's a sense of solidarity. Why? What is, what's causing this? What are the underlying mechanisms at the, at the neurochemical level as well? at the psychological and the neurochemical level. So um, I wanna, I'm diving now a bit more into my, my PhD work. I wanna uh, quickly define prosociality within the, the framework of synchrony studies. So this is the large canon of research that, look at, that looks at synchrony, interpersonal synchrony, interpersonal coordination, interpersonal entrainment. And I'm gonna largely define that as um, moving together in time in the same rhythm and the same beat. Um, but so in the literature, when we're talking about prosociality, it can refer to a number of things. It's kind of an umbrella term for liking, perceived similarity, affiliation, identification, social bonding, altruism, cooperation, trust, compassion, and also kind of more classic empathy, both emotional and cognitive. Um, so my research deals with mostly with, uh, with social bonding and affiliation, identification, and other forms of prosociality in terms of uh, actions of care. So I'm gonna quickly overview for you the, the research that has been done so far on synchrony and its effects on prosociality. So these were all one-time lab studies done by, by uh, researchers in a very, very various different fields, mostly psychology, um, where they brought together different groups of people and had them synchronize with each other. And these synchrony tasks could be walking, right? So going on a walk with somebody and walking in synchrony. Uh, tapping, a lot, there's a lot of tapping studies where just tapping could have an effect on prosociality. Um, stepping, so the marching aspect, drumming, uh, limb movements, such as like raising one's arm and, and syncing with somebody else. And these studies always involve a synchrony condition, so the two people or a group do this movement together in synchrony, and an asynchrony condition, so where they do the movement but not synchronously. And then these, these were compared to see how, what was the effect on that prosociality. Uh, sometimes there's also an alone condition within these studies. And then they measured for things like liking, identification, social bonding, trust, social closeness, social cohesion, and the list goes on. So their findings are that synchrony has been shown to increase empathy and altruism. In this study particularly, people were more willing to donate their time so at their own cost, right? Their own time, they're willing to donate it to somebody they had synchronized with over the people who had not been in a synchrony condition. And they're willing to donate their time for a longer period than those uh, they had in the groups that had not synchronized. They didn't tend to donate their time. Um, synchrony has been shown to increase liking and affiliation, uh, cooperation. So some of the studies that Diana was mentioning earlier, the economic games, they had people synchronize and perform these games, and people showed to be more cooperative after synchrony than before. And again, this could be something as simple as tapping the finger and synchrony with somebody for one minute. This this had an effect on person. Yeah. Then also synchrony has been shown to increase social bonding, both within, uh, within dyads, but also within a group. I think the largest group was four people at a time. And synchrony with music increased liking and affiliation more than synchrony with 
a metronome. So this is also showing a little bit that the music can also be involved in uh, the sense of, of connection with other people. So the limitations of these studies uh, and the, the literature so far on synchrony is that there's no naturalistic studies of synchrony. And all of the ones that I've mentioned so far, they were lab studies, which is super useful because it gives us an idea of, uh, we have some control conditions, we can see that there are some effects, but we don't know, um, we don't have a lot of studies that, we don't have any studies that look at synchrony in a naturalistic way and its effects on prosociality. Um, secondly, we don't have any synchrony studies that explore the effect of synchrony across a time frame. So people coming together and moving in synchrony with each other over a period of time. And this can be really important to know about because we see this all around us in, in different uh, ritualistic contexts. People come together regularly to move and we don't have research on this. Uh, thirdly, there have been very few studies that look at synchrony with an intergroup context. So that is synchronizing between people who have different backgrounds from each other. Most of the studies look at synchrony between people from the same culture, from the same community, and we don't have a lot of studies that look at it from two different sociocultural backgrounds. There are two studies that have looked at this and they're extremely promising. Actually, I think this is where synchrony can shine. This is where synchrony has the most potential is in connecting people from different backgrounds. Because in the study where they had a Malaysian um, and a UK student and a UK and UK student conditions, the ones that the mixed uh, dyad had a higher uh, difference between the asynchrony condition and the synchrony condition. Whereas the UK and UK student dyad didn't show that much difference because they're already part of each other's in-group, right? So we can see that synchrony can really affect how we categorize people, can change how we categorize people. So, um, but, sorry, I forgot to say, uh, as there's no, there's also no consensus on how synchrony leads to pro-social outcomes. So there's a lot of theories, cognitive, uh, behavioral, um, biochemical, that, that look at how synchrony might be creating this kind of pro-social behavior and attitudes. Um, but there's no consensus yet. So um, I'm going to come back to oxytocin, which is something Diana mentioned briefly uh, in her in her presentation to you. And I mentioned that oxytocin is also has also been shown to uh, be impacted by synchrony, and vice versa. So they affect each other. There's not a lot of research on endogenous oxytocin and synchrony, um, but there is there are two studies which I'll mention now where they were given oxytocin intranasally or placebo. Um, and in the first study, they showed that intranasal oxytocin uh, increased pro-social, uh, increased interpersonal motor synchrony, uh, ability to, to synchronize with another person compared to um, placebo. And also that oxytocin improves sensory motor prediction in unidirectional coupling. So when one person was tapping and another person was trying to follow them in synchrony, those who had been given oxytocin were able to do that better than those given placebo. Uh, so. I actually went quite quickly through this, which is, I guess, a good thing. Um, so I'm, I posit in my, in my research that dance opens up a positive space to encounter the other. And I want to quickly mention another social psychology theorist, Alport, um, who came up with this uh, contact hypothesis, which is simply that by spending time having positive contact with somebody from an outgroup can affect one's whole experience of that entire outgroup as a gen generalized. So if um, it, essentially spending time with one person from an outgroup can change how you positively perceive that outgroup and it lowers bias towards that outgroup. Positive contact is a little bit complicated to define, but uh, I think you, you can get an idea of positive means usually a, a good experience. Um, there's a secondary transfer effect of this, uh, this theory, which has also been shown in literature that when you experience positive contact with somebody from an outgroup, doesn't just impact how you see that outgroup, but it impacts how you see different other outgroups, uncontacted outgroups. So you can see that having contact with people from different backgrounds in your own can actually really drastically change how you look at diversity and how you look at um, people that are different than you. It can be extremely uh, useful uh, for, for overcoming intercultural bias and so forth. Um, so the two main mechanisms that I'm positing are involved in how uh, dance access is the space to encounter the other in a positive way um, is contact. So having physical, uh, having a, the, the symbolic contact with other cultures and other people from different backgrounds um, is, a, is, is one part of that contact. But then you have also in, in the dance, at least in Poho, you have the physical contact. You have the, you have the two sides, you have the symbolic cultural contact, but you have also the physical contact. 
which speaks beyond languages, right? If you're dancing with somebody from a different language or they're sharing their cultural dance with you, you don't need to, you don't need to speak the same language to understand a part of them, right? And to have empathy, we have to be able to reach the other person. So in dance, you can reach the other person. I, I believe this is a really powerful way to reach the other person. And then oxytocin is the second, uh, is the second mechanism that I've already mentioned. Um, and it's released through vocal synchrony, we know, and it's also released through touch. As Diana said, through any kind of affectionate touch, a hug and embrace, as you see in the photo, uh, that this releases oxytocin in our system and that this can boost prosociality. And as Diana was saying before, um, Oxytocin affects us differently if we were with somebody from our in-group or somebody from our out-group. So if we're primed to believe somebody's from our out-group and we take intranasal oxytocin, it can make us even more aggressive towards that person. But if you come into a space with other people, an intimate space, a vulnerable space, right? This is not a, this is not a, a safe, it is safe, but it's, you have to be somewhat vulnerable to be in an embrace with somebody like this. Then you're almost priming to, to see those people that you're dancing with as part of your group. And then when you have this spike in oxytocin, you, you can extend that, that sense of who's in my in-group. So coming to the, I'm coming to the end of my presentation, but also just reaching the beginning of my doctoral work. Um, my hypothesis in my research so far is that uh, through intergroup inter dancing, so dancing between people with different backgrounds, oxytocin is increased. And this allows for the extension of in-group identification to include one's dance partners. So by Dancing with people, we have an increased oxytocin, and this allows me to extend who I consider part of my in-group. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna close now because I know we're running quite late on time. Um, but I, if you'd like to speak with me a bit about my research design, which I'm I'm starting field work in January, feel free to come up to me and talk to me about that later. But I wanted to provide you with a um, theoretical roadmap to understanding how synchrony may increase uh, empathy and connection between people of different backgrounds and different cultures. I'm gonna end with a quote from uh, Thomas Durino, who's a wonderful ethnomusicologist who also researched participatory dance and music. So he says, through moving and sounding together in synchrony, people can experience a feeling of oneness with others. The signs of, the social in the signs of this social intimacy are experienced directly, body to body, and thus in the moment are felt to be true. Music, dance, festivals, and other public expressive cultural practices are a primary way that people articulate the collective identities that are fundamental to forming and sustaining social groups, which are in turn basic to survival. So thank you so much for your time. And please talk to me afterwards if you want to hear more. Um, the micro dramaturgist network that of course Abox has been leading in many years now uh, in what has been such a fruitful and joyous collaboration always so it's uh, seeing friendly faces in the room is always a privilege and everyone I don't know that but it's talking to you are very lovely and people who haven't spoken to I hope so too. so later off I go I promise I'll do my best to stay in time so um firstly it's like this and then like this <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have this funding from Riksbank and Jubileums Funding Sweden, uh, one of the primary funders for my research project. And uh, my research project, I can't go into too much detail on, but I will tell you that it's called Performing Interspaces, Social Fluidities in Contemporary Theater. And um, I'm based at Mid Sweden University, of course, but also Part of my, so I've been on research sabbatical basically is what this means for the past uh, year and until the end of 2022, writing a book. Um, I've also spent some of that time as visiting professor at Sapienza University of Rome. And in fact, the book chapter from which I'll present later on today was written during that time. And I really believe in crediting environments as well. It was a wonderful environment to work in. So thanks go out to those colleagues as much as to my founder and my home institution. So anyway, I'm a theater historian of the recent and contemporary period. Um, I go further back into the past, uh, so through to the 19th century, for example, but primarily I focus on this period after the Second World War. And 
in historicizing the present, we know there are challenges, uh, but also many rewards. And this project looks at plays, as, as the slide says, uh, that were mostly written after 2010. Radical changes have happened to our societies in this period, as we all know. So I'm hoping to capture those changes. Why interspaces? My uh, original training was in phenomenology in subjectivity, Merleau-Ponty and approaches primarily. I don't subscribe to binaries. Uh, I subscribe to the both ends. So when I talk about interspaces, I'm interested in fluidities. I'm interested in flexibilities. I'm interested in accounting for geographical, notional, conceptual, spatial, perceptual spaces, uh, locations, sites that don't conform. And maybe they don't conform because they're not desirable. Maybe they don't conform because they are durational in a strange way, both transient and, and permanent. Maybe they're abandoned. Maybe they're misused. Maybe they're abused. Um, but in any case, they're interesting. So to me, at least, I believe that forms um, that are experimental move forward, the ways in which we engage with our societies, which is why I primarily look at how experimentation has fed into contemporary playwriting um, in ways that have allowed at least or encouraged communities to engage with their worlds in what I think are richer and fuller ways um, and, and have enhanced this sense of active citizenship through active spe spectatorship. Um, so I've talked a little bit already about the next point there, but uh, the liminalities, the flows, the uncertainties, and the agencies that come with our convoluted contemporary experiences are very much part of what the book discusses. So my methodologies are driven very much from sociology. I work with geography as well, and um, I work a lot with theories and, and data coming out of the earth sciences. Um, I am compelled as a, as a thinker, as an academic, as a writer, a historian working today, uh, by this extraordinary crisis that we're experiencing in, in climate. Um, and I, I find it impossible to not engage with it, but also I find it essential and a responsibility and a duty that I'm honored to serve before in this moment, we need to speak of this moment. Um, of course, this project began before, in my mind at least, um, before COVID. Uh, the funding came through in 2021 and the project had its official funded start um, in January 2022. Now, as I said before many times, I'm a theater scholar, I'm not a playwright. Um, I'm very sensitive to the ways in which theater companies and artists have been impacted by COVID. Um, not every company uh, made it through, uh, not everything was supported by subsidy structures. And I think that like the environment, to quote Una Chaudhuri, who of course is one of the past leaders, in um, eco scholarship and theater, um, just like the environment is a lens through which we need to be looking at plays and texts and performances. So COVID has become such a lens because anything that happens now is a performance that happens after this virus has happened to us. And not everyone has been impacted in the same way, but we've all been impacted in some way. So that to me is also a lens. I hope that uh, once the book is out, um, people will agree with me that I've worked to uh, have a diversity of corpus. I find that also uh, an essential act and the responsibility that we have. And this diversity means different things, of course. Um, but it, it's also, for me, representation is really important, is what I'm trying to say. So there are some trends that recur in the case studies that I've chosen across the book, which is still underway in its writing process. Um, and and the, the trends that I have here are the ones that are most relevant to the case study I'll be sharing with you today. So uh, the near historical play, plays that are written today or in the recent period that deal with historical events um, through a dramaturgical course intervention and in some way uh, that is not simply uh, doing documentary, um, but that deal with historical fact in any case. The quasi-historical play so there is maybe in what I describe as such, some historical roots, some event that is happening, that is informing the plot of the play. Today, the tale is common, for example, in the play I'm talking about, but events around the plot are also fictional. So maybe there is one historical root, but there's also a very fictionalized plot around uh, that very context. The dark pastoral play. Now we know the dark pastoral has been a strongly emerging term, 
these re-envisioned, reimagined relationships between individuals and their environment uh, beyond an idealized notion of how we engage with spaces in awe, in um, uh, exuberance, but what if our relationships with our natural environment are more complex than that, more convoluted than that. And of course, the more broadly environmental play, I very much subscribe to the uh, school of thought originated in the work, again, of Una Chaudhuri, among many others. But Una Chaudhuri stands out, Wendy Aaron st stands out, and Teresa J. May also. And of course, uh, more recently, also Carl very Claire Finborough. To go back and reread through an environmental angle what was there before, so bringing the canon, effectively. Um, so in a way, I, I don't think that I can look at anything anymore without considering it from an environmental angle, if I'm honest. Uh, and it's something that I actively try to do. But there are some plays, of course, that have the environment written into their plots quite actively in terms of landscape, in terms of setting, in terms of how stage directions are framed, how the plays are staged, that's the director, that's the scenographer, not only the playwright, so, or the company. So anyway, the more broadly environmental play is, uh, and the play that we can think of on environmental terms is what is a priority for me. And um, today I'll be talking about one such play. Uh, a couple of words on the plot, and then I have to go into the script, which will keep me honest or on time. And uh, this is Lucy Kirkwood's The Well King. The Well King, I'm not sure if people in the room, are you familiar with the play? Great. I have to sum up a very complex plot really quickly. The, the Well King is quite a long play. If I recall, well, it's about two and a half hours in performance and it has an interval as well. What you see here are these 12 matrons that are gathered in March 1759, somewhere in the borderland, so that's an interspace, of Norfolk and Suffolk, because they are a jury that have to determine whether a woman that's called Sally Poppy is pregnant, because Sally Poppy has just been an accomplished, um, an accomplice, um, a, a, a co-murderer uh, of a child. Um, her lover and herself abducted a child and he killed it and she did not intervene. So Sally Bobby is 21 years old. She's just come back home to her husband after being away for quite some time in the middle of the night, full of blood. We see this in the beginning of the play. So that she's guilty is never questioned. And she has been found guilty by a group of law but these women are summoned because they have to establish if she's pregnant, which will save her from being hanged. She claims to be pregnant by her lover. The four matron of that jury is a woman called Elizabeth or Lizzie Luke. She is a midwife. If Sally Poppy is 21, Lizzie Luke is 35. This is important because she's also the mother of Sally Poppy, but she gave her up for adoption at infancy. It, she's the product of the rape. So basically, this comes out later on during the deliberations of the jury, but these very complex legacies are unfolding. Um, and during these deliberations, we get to see different acts of empathy taking root in that room and um, the possibility of empathy. So when Grass invited me to do this talk, I was thinking, how does empathy actually fit into my work? Not only towards the environment, but also towards others. So these acts of care that are conceptualized on a much broader scale towards the human and the non-human. These women have to develop these acts of empathy towards each other, towards their shared task, towards the, this individual, the accused, the murderess, that is profoundly unsympathetic. She never shows any remorse whatsoever throughout the play. She's someone who's very strong-willed and she's someone also who's very, um, unkind to others, but the only event that she cares about is Halley's Comet, that she's been waiting to see for quite some time now. Now, my research revealed writing this chapter, which is called uh, The Deviant, uh, that, that the Welkin is one of the case studies in, um, that Halley's Comet had actually become a phenomenon for quite some time. It wasn't this thing in the sky that you saw and that kind of, you know, how this happened. Its visibility decreased and increased over quite some time and depending on where you were. So journals from that time are actually really beautiful reading. And of course, 
the, the sentiment that the play captures that the comet maybe has happened or maybe hasn't happened is actually really historically factual. So anyway, that's all she cares about, the comet. It's the only thing that moves her, the non-human, the human has utterly failed to move her. Um, the play itself is an interspace because it, it started in January 2020 um, in London at the National Theatre, and it closed early, not because it wasn't doing well, but because of COVID. So it would have closed in March, uh, end of March, and it obviously we know what happened in March 2020. So I'm very fascinated by the text for many reasons. Now I go into the script, which will keep going. Um, so Kirkwood's dramaturgical trope of placing the death of a female child at the heart of the action, with the action itself being determined by the involved agents, these women, ability, abilities to find a balance between the human and the other than human is important. It is the maintenance of this interspace that both encourages involvement and discourages emotionalism. A child born to a family of privilege has been murdered, and a woman born in precisely the opposite conditions shows no remorse and is guilty. There is a sensitivity and an ability to move in Kirkwood's play, but beyond sentimentalism, the celestial tone delivered by a landmark scene, it's this one here, in the National Theatre production is crucial to this. The scene in question serves to create an interspace in nuanced ways, first physically, then notionally and temporally. So first we must note the physical gesture of, um, so just to, this is, what happens after the scene you're looking at. And then, uh, so this is what happens after the interval. What you were looking at a moment before, can I go back? Yes. Thanks so much, sorry. The first time I found it was great. Thank you. So they're deliberating in this room. It's a really uncomfortable and unhospitable environment. And the reason that it is so is it's so cold and they have forbidden from using anything that will make it comfortable, like a fire, for example. But in this fireplace there, they've lit a fire. The chimney hasn't been swept ever. So this very loud noise happens, which really is like an explosion. And what's caused it is that the crowd has kind of crashed through the chimney and landed in the room. So this crowd has created this wave or cloud of dust. And this is quite important because here Lizzie Luke is holding a glass. Trigger warning, um, in the glass is breast milk that they have managed to extricate from a Sally Poppy who's apparently in the very early stages of pregnancy. So the milk has become gray, of course, from the ash from the chimney. And this is how we go into interval in the production. When we go back from the interval, this is what we see. Sally Poppy that you can't see very well, she's somewhere here, is uh, lying on her back on the ground. Everything is freeze frame. It's like a, a tableau vivant, I suppose. Women who are not Sally Poppy and uh, are, are not involved in the action of this scene uh, are not moving at all. She's on her back and she's playing airplanes with this child that is the murdered child. So in a way, we're seeing what has happened that we have heard about, because this is someone who got on well with this child whose minder she was. They were playing. And in a very in interesting interview by um, Lucy Kirkwood, the playwright, I think she talks about how playing airplanes is, in fact, a later trope. So the game would not have existed at the time to push someone up, hold them in your hands like that. So that's what we see. The child is lifted upwards out of the set and up to the sky. And of course, Sally Poppy remains to the ground. So it's quite an important moment. Uh, it creates an interspace, as I was saying, in nuanced ways, first physically, then notionally and temporarily. Because when is this happening exactly? This has happened, but not as metaphysically beautiful, maybe as we see here, not at all like that. So first we must note the physical gesture of Sally Poppy on her back playing airplanes in a way that as she lies on her back on the floor, the child being balanced on her hands and facing her, eventually lifted upwards in a movement that implies she has pushed her to heaven, um, is, is shown in this moment of transition between life and death. Uh, it's, it's a moment of extraordinary scenography that, that communicates non-verbally an extraordinary amount of information. 
So the sequence also accomplishes the depiction of the separation between heaven and earth. Sally Poppy very much remains on earth with all that this entails. The child vanishes, uh, becoming as elusive as Halley's comet itself. And the comet is, in fact, as I was saying before, the only element that really moves that otherwise um, very emotionally closed up woman, Sally Poppy. The moment finally is occurring in a time plane entirely separate from the standard action time of the play itself. It is an interruption and a fissure in temporal linearity as well. There is more to be said in terms of how the comet as historical backdrop and dramaturgical device serves to create temporal interspaces. The play opens in production as well as playtext with a silent scene that features the matrons performing household tasks of manual and physical care and labor. It is titled Act One Housework and it stands alone, but is also the precursor of Act Two, the comet that comes at the very end of the play. So the two serve as bookends uh, in its beginning and ending, at least in the text. The circularity that the acts convey captured in the circularity of the comments reappearance because one action is in 1759, the other in 2061, when the comment will come back. Evidence is that for women, the narrative is not a straightforward or a linear one, but one that repeats across time or at least runs the risk of repeating as in a loop. So as per the stage direction, which I'm not going to read, I leave it to you to have a look. Um, this is the status of women's in 17, of women's lives in 1759 and in 2061. It's really fascinating that everything in one way or another connects to the natural world or to inanimate objects, in all cases to the environment, surrounding, and, and demonstrates the women's care towards this environment across time. So these acts of, I will call them empathy, towards that which is not animate, but requires constant care and attention in order to retain and maintain the lives. So if we go to the next one, because it continues for quite some time and brings us to it, the comet is, the comet is returning, passing overhead. So um, it's really fascinating, of course, that what happens here is that Lizzie Luke is the first one that sees the comet again in 2061, just as she's the one that's leading the efforts to establish if, if Sally Poppy is pregnant. So her prominence in both uh, temporal planes, let's say, is quite a significant, a significant one. So I want to go back for a moment to where these deliberations happen in this jury of matrons. It's described in the text as a room with, I quote, no food, no water, no fire, no candle. That's why they try to light that fire, disrespecting um, these systemic uh, instructions so as to create an environment of care towards each other. So the environment that they're handed is indicative of the lack of institutional care against women as another form of coercion, even as their agency is very much sought by that, by that same system that oppresses them. But it is this inhospitable room that we've seen in that slide before that will also become the space of community and of intervention. It is the site where women will develop tactics of care towards the transient space, attempting to, attempting to make it at least tolerable, but also towards each other, all in the spirit of the preservation of something greater than themselves, of mutual self-recognition that does not erase, but acknowledges and respects difference. They're extremely different, these women, in ages, in stages of their lives, in stages of maternity or non-maternity, imagine all possibilities for that. Imagine all possible iterations of what a woman might have experienced at that time. So they're different, but they also have experiences in common. And the act of care towards their shared space is reflective of and directly related to their care and attention to their legally assigned task. As Lizzie Luke, again, the full matron, would say in order to focus, it is important, in addition to the individual circumstances of each of the matrons, to acknowledge that, and I quote Kirkwood's text, the whole affair is a farce. We are cold, hungry, tired, thirsty women, and all of us have had our housework interrupted. It is a poor apparatus for justice, but it is what we have, this room, 
the sky outside that window and our own dignity beneath it. Together, we must speak in one voice. It is almost impossible that we should make the right decision, but shall we not try? So this is what I mean by interspaces. It's, this is an awkward space. It's an undesirable space. It's pretty much a borderline uninhabitable space, but it's also the margin for change. It's the only one that they have. One of the rare moments when society calls upon women at that time to make a decision that's collectively significant. So this agency that is developing is an act of genuine civic intervention. And that's the importance of that site, um, literally speaking also metaphorically. So what is acknowledged in this uh, quotation I've just read in this appeal to her peers by Lizzie Luke is that it is this space of interruption in the interlude where the event actually occurs. The narrative overall may well be and is another, and time, depth, and longitude might prepare one for the action there to take in the crucial moment, but the change occurs in the in-between. Parenthetical time and space may be incidental, but it is not negligible. Rather, it is momentous. Systemic injustices might endure, but so does solidarity, or at least in this moment, the hope for it. So then, I'm totally getting there. This is theater that is not about sympathizing, and it is not about absolving, whether the characters or ourselves. At the end of Kirkwood's play, Lizzie Luke, uh, that we've seen um, before, kills her daughter, Sally Poppy, it's become revealed that she's her daughter, in an act of compassion. Um, she's found to be pregnant. A male doctor comes in and examines her in a very poignant scene, um, determines she's pregnant resolutely. She's spared the hanging, but the mother of the dead child comes in and in a silent scene instructs one of the authorities of the court to basically dispose of the pregnancy. He beats Sally severely, she loses the baby, she bleeds, she's going to be hanged. So she pleads with her mother to absolve her of this pain, to save her from that hanging, from the vilification of the crowd. And a beautiful moment happens between Lizzie Luke and uh, Emma Jenkins, another of the matrons, where Emma Jenkins tells Lizzie Luke a story about a dog that her husband once had. And that dog hated Emma Jenkins. And one day that dog died by accidental poisoning, but she was sure that her husband would accuse her of murdering the dog because of the difficult relationship they had. So she tells that story to Lizzie as a kind of metaphor, reassuring her that if she were to kind of spare her daughter of the suffering of being hanged, she will support her. So when Lizzie Luke asks her, but how do your husband believe you? She says, Emma Jenkins, well, my sister swore blind that that's how things happened. So the, this tacit understanding, this moment, I'll use what uh, Zabos was saying before, radical empathy. This is what happens in that moment. And they understand each other. So Lizzie Luke removes the laces from her face, her corset. And then she asks her daughter to gaze upwards out the window. She cleans her face and she says to her, that's it, that's the comment right there. And she takes the lace and comes from behind. And as, as, as Sally Poppy is saying, but where, where I can't see it, ah, and she dies like that. So she dies being moved by the only phenomenon that she thinks she has seen in that moment that she's ever cared about. She has cared about that comet, the non-human. And she dies in a moment when someone has been kind to her even against the odds, even against of what we might expect would happen. And I suppose I'm going to close by saying that um, I think Kirkwood's play is as important as it is because in showing these varying acts of care towards the world, towards each other, towards those that we might say, you know, are not deserving of that care, poses a very important and intriguing question and that question is, how might we become more involved in the dialogue that might produce change in the sense of beauty, of responsibility, of agency, in margins that open and close, in situations where we might not expect to find ourselves and that still compel us to act? Thanks so much.
again, thanks for uh, having me today. And I want to, to, to I will start with um, um, a work by um, uh, Simon Granger, um, who wrote a play clo um, called Closed Lands, which was originally written in uh, 2011 and reworked in uh, 2019, where the place, a narrator affirms that you think you have arrived, but you still have a border to cross. If you do not have a visa, the border moves with you. If your status is irregular, you will always be left with a border to cross. So Closed Lens was written as a response to a specific um, um, asylum um, uh, case in France, uh, which was witnessed by the, um, the playwright uh, at his local kindergarten. And it was all, the play, play was also part of the um, uh, my, um, Migrations Harbour Europe. It's not working. Uh, it is working. Okay. It was part of Migrations Harbour Europe, which was a, uh, a uh, uh, arts and culture project with uh, Glass and Vicky was part of it. Uh, so it was a collaborative project um, uh, together. I mean, it was led by Migrant Dramaturgist Network, but it was a collaboration with Legal Aliens Theatre and um, uh, our call of theatre in London. And so, um, but so today I wish to kind of draw on this project um, to explore how migrant theatre initiatives can practice three things, um, 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 uh, resistance, political responsiveness, and empathy by um, 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 resisting established uh, narratives and fostering new aesthetics of migration and uh, refugeedom. And I think theatre especially is, a, is, is, is a uni, has a unique capacity to make those states of displacement um, and asylum visible and also to intervene uh, in mainstream narratives of migration and meaning making, and um, really to foster and promote um, visions and um, um, shared visions, uh, rather, and solidarity across social, cultural, and, and political uh, divides. So um, when we are talking about um, uh, empathy in this context, I think I'm talking about solidarity. <laughs> Uh, so that's a, I think that's a very um, uh, interesting connection there. And again, as a live art genre that builds on continuous dialogue between um, uh, theater makers and the audiences, um, roles that often overlap in contemporary performance, theater is pretty much well, well, well placed to mediate uh, between complex uh, uh, migrant perspectives and experiences, which in turn, foster both emotional and cognitive uh, empathy on and off stage. Um, so I will, um, I will focus on, on, on closed lands instead of the whole project, which was a two years project. And, but first I would really want, kind of like to consider the construction of notions of strangeness, which is also related to, to, to empathy as we heard today. Um, which really often is used to describe um, uh, migrants. And um, uh, so in order to understand legal aliens in theaters, appropriation to um, uh, 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 appropriation and repositioning of migrancy, we kind of really need to look at how that figure of migrant as a stranger is constructed. So I used uh, quite a lot, I used Sara Ahmed's um, 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 theoretical framework, um, uh, which she put forward in Strange, Strange Encounters Embodied Others in Postcoloniality, um, where she gave an important analysis of the migrant, of, of the figure of the migrant as a stranger. And she stresses that the condition of being a stranger is determined by the event of leaving home. And for Ahmed, strangers are the ones who, in leaving the home of their nation, are bodies out of place in the everyday world they inhabit and the communities in which they come to live. So the definition of strangeness for Ahmed is really focused on the triad of uh, body, movement, and community. And um, so the migrant uh, existence is really pretty much marked by the presence 
in a contemporary landscape of dislocation and, and movement. Um, so feeling uh, and being displaced are intrinsic in understanding uh, strangeness, but it's also key to thinking through notions of familiarity, home and belonging or non-belonging. And so um, uh, Sarah Ahmed brightly observes that migration, and I would argue the migrant theater as well, um, um, invites us to consider what it means to be at home, to inhabit a particular place, and might also call, call us to question the relationship between identity, um, belonging, and, and home. Um, but I also think that migratory identities are not only forced through um, displacement and those individual migration journeys, but also through the systemic um, treatment of migrants in countries where, you know, where they arrive. Um, and I want to share a, a definition here um, with you, which was created by Migrant in Culture, which is a, which is a UK based uh, um, advocacy organization for culture workers, uh, migrant culture workers in, in, in the UK migration system. Um, and uh, because there's no legal in, in, in UK law, basically, there's no definitive kind of, um, um, uh, well, a def legal definition of the migrant in the UK. So basically, it's, it's um, defined through ethnicity, citizenship, heritage, and uh, the nationality. And so their um, uh, kind of definition of why it means, uh, what is a migrant, um, uh, um, they, they talk about uh, migrants, they talk about migrants with lived experience of migration or profile as a migrant, but they also talk about having totally different legal uh, legal statuses, so not just refugees, but also economic migrants and, and asylum seekers um, uh, as well. So their definition um, clearly acknowledges the complexities of, of, of migrants and migrant identities, while also responding to issues of migrant rights, equity, and discourses of colonialism, and, and especially state violence um, amidst the UK government's hostile environment policy. I don't know if you are familiar with this policy, it was created in 2012 by that, that time, uh, Theresa May, uh, who was the Home Secretary and then became Prime Minister. And um, so um, the whole system was created to, um, for migrants to be very uncomfortable and uh, not stay in the country at all. Um, so basically they argue that the wider UK immigration policy is a manifestation of systemic racism and legacies of uh, continuation of empire, colonization and extractive capitalism, which also kind of relates to, well, most of the ecological problems we are, we are talking about extractive capitalism. So dismantling such systemic forms of discrimination, therefore, involves opposing uh, oppression in all its forms. And so what, the other thing that really transpi transpires from this um, um, uh, definition is that migration is um, also historically layered. And Sarah Ahmed also uh, reflects on this multi-generational, multi-generational aspect of, of migrancy when um, she's stressing that migration is not only felt at the level of lived embodiment, but it's also a matter of generational acts of storytelling about prior histories of movement and dislocation. Um, so for her really positioning, um, migration or the figure of migrant as a stranger is really not enough in itself because it's a construct of complex um, um, societal uh, context and um, that create and sustain um, uh, migration. Uh, so she concludes, uh, Ahmed concludes that uh, to take the figure of the stranger as simply present is to overlook and forget the very relationship social antagonism that produced the stranger as a figure in the first place. And she goes further stating that um, this is also concealing how the stranger comes to being uh, through the marking out of inhabitable uh, spaces, bodies, and terrains of knowledge. 
So I'm not going to go into uh, uh, in more detail um, uh, about um, you know the, this concept of um, strangeness because then Sarah Ahmed really go, goes on to kind of draw on Ian Chambers' um, um, notion of migrants as um, as a presence that questions our present. And I think that is also kind of important because it, it kind of shows uh, how, uh, how constructing you know, the migrant figure as a stranger is not only related to the actual movement or the actual dislocation, but it, it's very much it's very very much a construct of the social political uh, social political context. And it, uh, but I would also mention that it's very close to. I mean, some of you probably know um, Dylan Frusa, um, um, uh, who who was a Brazilian Czech um, Jewish philosopher, uh, who who talks about the migrant figure as a mirror. And the window um, through which you can see yourself, but also you can see different historical contexts and your own. Uh, uh, and I think Alex, who's not here, <laughs> uh, he wrote a really good article about the metaphoral metaphoral. How do you pronounce it? About the migrant migration as a metaphor uh, in uh, in Flusser's in Flusser's philosophy, and especially his view on the migrant as a homeless as 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 a homeless um, uh, figure. So, but anyway, for both Ahmed and Flusser, um, migration really signals an encounter with difference, but also enables a very close examination um, of our own life as hosts. Uh, or um, or our host uh, or our society as host society, um, and in other words, basically the stranger is constructed not only through displacement. This is what I was talking about, it, but through displacement um, uh, um, experience, but also uh, through the political labeling that's uh, going on there. So. And this is where theater comes in, really, that you know, creating an ethical and empathic space to discuss that systemic uh, 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 practice is really important uh, in order to actually create some sort of meaningful encounter with with the other. And so, I will. I want to turn to. I want to turn to um, the production of uh, Simon Granger's um, uh, Closed Lands. Um, to discuss how migrants transgress multiple de uh, demarcation of places and spaces of belonging, or indeed uh, non-belonging. Um, so the play is really is created. It's a um, uh, it's a mixture of it's it's a monologue really and. Um, it shows that the walls uh, not only delineate movement, but also establish who does and does not belong. And the play is, is composed by eight um, uh, chants or, or poems, um, but it can also be read as a compact monologue for a single uh, voice. Um, it's an observer's um, account of border making and various stages of migration journeys. And it starts with uh, the construct. Well, it, st it starts with the deconstruction of the Berlin uh, Wall in 1889, and then quickly moves. And there's a quote here. Um, and then it moves through um, um, space and time, um, 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 starting with the uh, string of. Uh, wall building endeavors um, that start in the U.S. and the Mexico uh, Mexico borders. So, in tracing the history of walls, the journey continues in Africa, then the uh, then uh, the Sahara as natural uh, border, and it goes along the walls of Ceuta and Melilla in in Morocco. It's not in Morocco; it's in Spain, but it's a it's a Spanish enclave in Morocco. Two Spanish enclaves in Morocco, and it moves through the wall of water of the Mediterranean, and it ends the whole a play and uh, with the most impossible of, of all uh, walls, uh, which is the EU's asylum system uh, and the whole bureaucracy that involves. And so, Granger, well, it was what Granger is staging here is a discourse around migration. So, for him, 
the focus is no longer on a singular migration journey, but it's more holistically on the immigration uh, system. The play includes considerable amount of factual information from technical uh, specification of border technologies uh, to security reports, political statements by different um, uh, uh, politicians and uh, all sorts of dictators, allowing for a discursive um, rather than a narrative uh, driven uh, dramaturgy. And uh, the play was directed by Becca McFadden um, uh, for the Legal Aid Ministry, and they really followed this form, um, and they staged the play as a multimedia uh, a performance, mixing uh, movement, screening, um, and uh, to explore mi migrancy through the security um, uh, policies that aim to curt uh, curtail it. So there's no real um, uh, differentiation between the characters here. So there's loads of characters, there's, there's various characters in the place constantly changing tone, switching between different perspectives. So it evokes different, different migration journeys and different identities. And detecting these characters is really difficult because the narrative is constantly changing. So just to give you a few examples of, of, of this, a few examples of this. Uh, uh, so I just divided um, some of the um, some some of the lines into different characters, but in the play there's no there's no differentiation between these characters. So it can be read uh, parts of it. It can be read as coming from a migrant and a politician, um, or the police and border patrol. And I think. Um, uh, yeah, the police one, I, I found it really interesting um, uh, in terms of what it means to be illegally trafficking your own body through, your, through the, um, um, uh, through, through borders. Uh, so all these voices are really interchangeable and can be also read as a voice of a single migrant. And in the food production in 2020, um, we witnessed the dramaturgy built and multi-rolling and the actors rotating through a variety of characters to the tunes of uh, Tatry's game, uh, separating the scenes um, uh, played out here as a response to dehumanizing migration policies in the UK. And one of the reviewers, it was really interesting because one of the reviewers pointed out, and I quote here, uh, Carenza Evans' uh, argument saying that this device starkly uh, emphasizes the arbitrariness of the roles we inhabit. Our identities come largely, largely from the place in the system we are born into and not our intrinsic worth. And the director, Becca uh, McFadden, goes further when, when she actually is saying something very similar, saying that, well, we stand in the system is an accident of birth and geopolitics. Uh, so we see this most clearly in the, in, in the differentiation between the citizen and the migrant, but uh, crucially that these roles and positions uh, are really random, and and so uh, we can occupy each of these roles based based on the actual system and the privilege and and the power relations um, we are born into. Um, so there are two important aspects um, uh, highlighted here. Firstly, that migration by large is a social, cultural, and political construct um, for for them uh, driven by global inequalities that kind of links us back to um, Sarah Ahmed's analysis. And secondly, and I think this is where empathy can kind of um, uh, come in as, an, as, an, as a kind of uh, ethical, political dramaturgy, uh, really, by showing, uh, by giving voice or by kind of addressing the systemic issue of migrant representation. And at the World uh, Theatre, I'll show you uh, two uh, photos to go um, in here. This, this was taken at the Vault um, uh, because the it, the Vault, if you if if you don't know if 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 you don't know the place, it's it's, uh, it's under the Waterloo Station. Is this is is a, a series of disused um, disused um, uh, arches. Um, 
under the train station in London, it's a uh, um, very securitized zone and um, a key point of entry into the heart of the uh, British capital. So the performance space was divided into five areas here uh, through which the actors rotated. So the rules, while the rules and the players changed, uh, these uh, taped off islands um, like these ones um, remained in place. And at the center, you can see a stepping machine used by the migrant figure, always on the move, but fixed in space, never relocated. And a large bean bag, which is the um, uh, the citizen, it acted as a citizen's couch, uh, and this that that was completed by a, a, a MacBook uh, to fire out uh, comments and um, uh, and kind of you know reading the news and uh, reflecting you know, reflecting on that. Um, um, so yeah, yeah, I will wrap it up in well very shortly then. So basically, so basically, I just want to kind of return to um, um, uh, Grangia. Grangia was kind of inspired by um, um, Vandy Brown's uh, monograph of faith waning sovereignty. Um, uh, and so that the drum, it, what, it, what, I mean, the whole dramaturgy is all about working around the terms of insiders, outsiders, and who is trapped within the walls, and how, I mean, when we construct walls, who's who, I mean, it's not, not, not just for, to, to, to keep people out, it's also, it actually traps us in. Um, so um, um, he was um, really uh, influenced by that. And um, yes, I, I was about to talk about, you know, everyday border making and all that, but I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about everyday border making. Instead, what I'm, I'm saying that the production, the production, it, it really created a space um, for reflection, and by creating that, uh, by creating that space, it uh, it, it it really had, um, it really started to um, um, kind of give really give space to to an action driven type of empathy, like uh, an um, um, activist aesthetic or activist empathic uh, activist aesthetics, really. And I'm drawing here on to Terry Gibbons latest book uh, called Radical Empathy, Finding Path to Bridging Racial Divides. And um, uh, uh, saying that by offering creative space for empathy through reflection, uh, recognition, which I think is really important here and resistance. Um, so it facilitates not only a sense of empathy towards the other, but it also fosters narrative change by the very presence of the migrant voice. And so the term radical empathy was really coined by Terry Gibbons, where, um, who's a political scientist. And she argues that the people, uh, she argues that people need to extend their definition of empathy beyond understanding how another person feels and go deeper into understanding the origins. And I think Alex was talking about that as that, you know, the histories of that empathy. So we need to understand the biases and we need to understand the histories of those worldviews um, um, uh, before actually talking about, um, you know, emotional uh, empathic um, uh, processes or alongside that. And according to Gibbons, radical empathy is both emotional and cognitive, but it's a practice rather than a state of being. So it needs, it involves practicing, practicing empathy and taking action um, that focuses on what can we do to make changes as individuals and what can we do to make changes in society or, or, uh, or in a, uh, um, uh, you know, so, um, so societal context. And she particularly reflects on racism, saying that radical empathy requires us to put into practice the values that we profess as citizens of countries that value equality. And I think that's really important, uh, especially at this age. Um, um, uh, so yeah, so basically she's encouraging protest and uh, you know all sorts of uh, uh, activist um, um, uh, strands and. To, um, to finish um, um, with the with this paper, I'm showing this image of the the you know the closing scene of uh, uh, closed lands. Um, 
which ends with Brexit and uh, with um, um, uh, the UK founding the building of the concrete wall in, in Calais. And the playwright is saying that the um, uh, French side of the of the wall, they decided to grow vegetables uh, because they thought, you know, that's that's a very useful way to use use that wall. And what we see here is the actors chopping up all sorts of uh, all sorts of veg and serving to the uh, to the audience, which is about, again a very direct reference to to agriculture seasonal agriculture workers in the UK who were very much vilified in the British media, uh, you know, at that, at that time. And so just to, uh, just to uh, finish on the quoting um, Becca um, saying that, um, I mean, going back to the resistance bit here, I think staging a play on the hostility and violence of the immigration system can be understood as an act of resistance in this case, especially because of these hostile policy environments they are working uh, within, or well, not within, but they are working against, but, you know, um, and um, Becca uh, McFadden um, uh, closes the uh, a performance saying that here together in the dark, in the company of strangers, perhaps we can even build, even begin to tear down some of what has built, what has been built up. Thank you very much.